what can we do here without escalating a very tense situation in the Middle East? Well, this story is rich, as I understand it. The tanker is Russian-owned. Uh, oops. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the Houthis meant to do that. And it's quite amusing that the U.S. is trying to prevent tankers, maybe even including Russian tankers, from being hit by this uh, terror group uh, funded and trained by Iran. Um, what can we do? Uh, we can just hit the targets, and we're pretty good at this, uh, where the missiles are coming from. That's what we should be doing. Th this is international water, and we are protecting shipping uh, in the Middle East, and it's, it's the proper role of the United States. And sadly, uh, Iran is continuing its mischief along various borders of Israel and now also, obviously, in the Red Sea and, the, and, the, and, and, and uh, near Aden. So uh, I, I, you know, I applaud the Biden administration for doing the right thing. Well, Jane, it's interesting to hear you describe this essentially as an accident, an oops, if you will, except this is an oops with incredibly high stakes. Is that not really the biggest risk with yeah. how tense things are in the Middle East right now is of miscalculation or, or an accident that turns into something yeah. much more severe? I think that has been a huge risk from the beginning. Uh, but I think uh, uh, it's a good thing that Bill Burns is headed over there, hopefully to try for uh, the return of some prisoners, all would be a good number, uh, and, and, and a pause, in, at least a pause, in the military strikes in Gaza. I, I, I don't see the, a, an end game in this direction that makes any sense to me. The goal is to tamp this down. And uh, I'm strongly for, and I think the Biden administration is too, a path, not immediately, but a path to two states, not to reward uh, Hamas. Hamas should not be part of any new uh, government, or certainly not a lead role in any new government in the Palestinian Authority, if there is one, and Gaza, those combined. It should not be. Uh, but I, I think Israel's security will be um, far more secured by a deal uh, where there's de-weaponization of, the entire, uh, uh, of, of the entirety of Gaza, plus uh, good governance that leads to two states living side by side in peace. Yeah, we're dealing with, obviously, a couple of situations here, but one debate in Washington over uh, the border would impact the situation in both Israel as well as Ukraine, Jane. Uh, we can get into the border dispute, but it looks like it's on ice for right now. The Speaker of the House says it's DOA, and we've been talking uh, about what Ukraine would look like if the money, in fact, were cut off. And I asked Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council about that earlier today on Bloomberg. Here's what she said. If we do not provide this assistance, Ukraine is going to lose, and it is going to be our fault, and it is going to threaten Western security for the next 50 years. Could NATO get drawn in? Absolutely. Putin's plan is to reconstitute his forces, uh, and he may go after a NATO member next. Does that automatically pull the U.S. in? It does not automatically pull it in, but under the Article 5 guarantee, if a NATO mm -hmm. member were hit, they would have to have a discussion and they would likely defend that territory. So it would involve the United States. Can you put a finer point on that, Jane Harmon? What will happen to Ukraine in the weeks and months that follow money being cut off from the United States? Well, I, let me make a several points on that. First of all, it's essential that we provide the funds. Uh, we have pledged the aid. We need to follow through. Uh, the U.S. cannot get a reputation, which it sort of got after we left Afghanistan, that it walks away uh, from pledges that it makes. This would be very bad. Secondly, Israel, it, Europe is hesitating because we're hesitating. So there's more money at stake urgently uh, that Ukraine needs. Uh, my recommendation would, would be to do what has been recommended by Lawrence Tribe, Harvard Law School professor, uh, and, and I think he's right, which is to use the frozen funds uh, from Russian assets right now, which I think Biden has the authority to do. George H.W. Bush did this uh, when uh, uh, there was the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. He was able to freeze funds and then use them uh, for this purpose. Use those funds for the moment as a stopgap to give the money to Ukraine. It's, it's ridiculous uh, that Congress is not acting. A majority of Congress favors the aid. Uh, a majority of Congress also favors doing something about the border. And wouldn't it be sad if before he is elected, before he's even the nominee, what Donald Trump tells Congress to do is what Congress does instead of uh, what it has been prepared to do. It's a separate branch of government. And what 
uh, a majority of voters in the country want it to do. Yeah, and that's something we've been exploring over the last several days is the kind of pressure the former president could be exerting on Congress to not do a, a deal like this. But it, something you hear raised in Congress often, Jane, is the idea that there is no plan that the Ukrainians have or that U.S. authorities have shared to actually win the war, bring about an end to a war, and that what a lot of them want is that kind of game plan. We're now almost two years into this thing, Jane. Is there really any chance of it coming to a conclusion soon? Oh, well, I certainly hope so. The goal would be uh, to give Ukraine the momentum and to have maybe a, a negotiation with Russia about an endgame when Ukraine is at its strongest. That's the point. Let's understand that Russia has not abided by ceasefires or pledges. In 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for a promise by the world including Russia, to respect its sovereignty. Uh, Russia is also a member, of, they both are, of the United Nations, and the, the prime tenet there is to respect the sovereignty of other countries. So Russia doesn't play by any rules. And wouldn't it be ridiculous to let Russia win now when Ukraine has been fighting its heart out, as you said, as your reporter said, to protect the West and to to avoid getting the U.N., the U.S., and other NATO countries uh, involved in war with Russia. That's a much worse outcome. So uh, I think that aid now, what Ukraine needs, I have recently been in Europe and I also saw the Ukrainians in Davos. What they need is long range fires, uh, long range weapons that can, they can shoot into Crimea, which is part of Ukraine, occupied by Russia, but part of Ukraine to take out the Russian installations that are used to lob the missiles into the other parts of Ukraine. This could be easy to do. Lots of that long range fire is in Europe. I mean, part of the part of the aid that that we get in the U.S. gives our uh, in defense industrial base in the U.S. the money to backstop weapons that are in other places. And those are the weapons uh, that go into Ukraine. So our defense industrial base makes money on this aid. I mean, this is a craziness. And I understand that it's somewhere in Europe. There are long range fires that could actually be targeted at the Karch Bridge. That's the the landline between Russia and Crimea that that some of the uh, U.S. weapons, the long range attackums are not able to take out. But wouldn't that be uh, w a wonderful story to block Russia mm -hmm. on the ground from mm -hmm. going into Ukraine to ha to to uh, use its installations to, to hurt Ukraine. I think there could be a good outcome here. Congress needs to step up mm. and the Biden administration yeah. should use these frozen funds right now.